Pike Place Market in Seattle, one of the most successful examples of urban preservation on the planet. You could almost say it's a victim of its own popularity, but I don't think that's quite accurate. So today we're gonna to talk about what makes it great. We'll contrast it with another Seattle tourist magnet, the waterfront, take a little detour to talk about what on earth is happening with Alaskan Way, and we'll look at why Pike Place Market, as great as it is, still hasn't been pedestrianized, and what that means for the prospect of turning basically any street in the U.S. into a car-free space. It's all coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer-suggested topics always welcome, and I've been asked to talk about Pike Place Market a bunch of times, but it was going to happen regardless, because it really is a unique institution. It is often overrun with out-of-town visitors, but unlike a lot of tourist magnets, there's a reason why people come here. It's because it really is like nothing else in the U.S., both in terms of sheer size, but also how unfamiliar the whole thing feels if you're a first-time visitor. I'm not going to dive into the whole history of how the market was saved from the wrecking ball and the minutia of how it's governed today. I'll link the best resource I found on the historical aspect from a 1981 edition of the Seattle Weekly. The article is Market Wars, really highly recommended if you're looking for a powerful case study on the politics of historic preservation, urban renewal, and entrenched business interests. The short version is, in 1963, the city of Seattle unveiled a new downtown plan, which proposed essentially leveling the entire area bounded by First Avenue, Union Street, Western Avenue, and Lenora Street, basically the entire footprint of today's market and more, and then constructing a much more modestly sized Pike Place Market on top of a massive terraced parking garage and redeveloping everything else. To be fair, Pike Place had been in some decline for a while. It had peaked as a functioning market in the 20s and 30s before people started driving to supermarkets with huge parking lots, but even so, the downtown plan was completely outrageous to a lot of people. Fast forward to 1971 and Initiative 1, the Keep the Market Initiative, appears on the local ballot. It's opposed by the downtown business establishment, all the major media outlets, and the city of Seattle itself, all of whom promote the idea that voting yes will lock in downtown blight for decades to come. Despite all that, the initiative passes handily, and to be fair, there was real concern that no one knew where the money was going to come from to rehabilitate the market, especially with as dire as economic conditions were in Seattle in the early 70s, but for the most part, the establishment ultimately fell in line with the will of the voters, federal money showed up, and the city embraced the market, which now stands as a highly visible urban preservation success story. And if you can't tell by now, this is personal for me. In spite of how overrun with tourists the market can get, it's always been a kind of touchstone when I come back to Seattle. The sights, the sounds, the smells, the flavors, they all feel like they're woven into my DNA. But also, I find it all really illustrative of a bigger, more complex question, which is what gives a city its identity? And what actually differentiates one city from another? So Initiative One created a historic district, put all of the buildings into public ownership, and chartered the Pike Place Market Preservation and Development Authority, a nonprofit public corporation, to operate the market. So let's take a little urbanist tour of Pike Place Market and talk about why, all these years later, and post-pandemic, it's still such a draw for locals and out-of-town visitors. If you want to be cynical, you can just say it's a lot of clever marketing. Like, you can't watch a broadcast of a Seattle sporting event without getting some sort of cutaway to the Pike Place Fish Company. And I'm not going to linger here, but this is the intersection of Pike Street and Pike Place, which is really ground zero of the market. I will come back to the main market building, but there's a lot more going on here. All of these are buildings that were slated for demolition at one point or another, and they're all home to multiple Seattle institutions. For example, the corner market is going to be a destination if you're in the market for hard left reading material. The sanitary market, so named because they were enlightened enough not to allow horses in the building. Post Alley, not a building, but it's its own pedestrian corridor running between First Avenue and Pike Place, with tons of unique little places you just can't really find anywhere else. A lot of these businesses have been here as long as I can remember, and they're basically all independent shops. The ones that are part of national chains started here. These are their first locations. Because of the way the market's nonprofit charter is structured, commercial lease rates are kept low, so there's very little turnover. 
any other place like this would have been overrun by chain establishments decades ago, but not Pike Place. This is like the kind of socialism everyone loves. Note that through all these ancillary buildings and alleyways, east of the primary market building, there really is unfettered motor vehicle access, which is wild, but I'm gonna hold off a bit longer before I start ranting about it. Okay, now the heart of the market, the main building arcade, which can still function as a grocery store of sorts for downtown residents. Produce, flowers, multiple fish markets, other kinds of vendors, and restaurants that have been here for over a century. And this footage is from the morning, right at opening. I tried to come here and film later in the day, but uh, we'll come back to that. And some of the appeal is that it is a great farmer's market, but a lot of it is just that around practically every corner, there's a beautiful view of Elliott Bay, so the whole thing becomes sort of a one-of-a-kind sensory experience. The market feels endless, partly because there's a warren of corridors and shops below the main arcade, terraced into the hillside. Again, a lot of these shops have been here basically forever. I can't verify that this is actually the world's oldest comic shop, but this is where I came to buy like X-Men and Avengers comics when I was 10 years old. I still have a few screenplays from this place too. There is still affordable housing at the market, and there's the economy market south of the main arcade. The little stub of Pike Street that runs under the economy market and connects up with the northern extension of Post Alley has performance spaces and restaurants, but it's also the site of probably one of the most unfortunate features of Pike Place Market. Like, if you don't know what this place is, I'm not going to explain it because it's disgusting. It's been here for decades, just grossing people out, but recently it's become more and more of a tourist attraction in its own right because it turns out that fossilized chewing gum is rather Instagrammable. Okay, let's have a short interlude and talk about the market's relationship with Seattle's waterfront. In 1953, the Alaskan Way Viaduct was constructed, which created an unsightly, noisy barrier that walled the market off from Elliott Bay. Some of this was mitigated with a variety of convoluted stair climbs and access ways, but in 2019, the viaduct was finally deconstructed, restoring views and permeability that were lost for decades. I'll talk a bit more about Alaskan Way in a minute, but let's just assert that the Seattle waterfront has all the odious aspects of over commercialized tourist hotspots that Pike Place Market largely avoids. It looks like Fisherman's Wharf, or basically the waterfront of any U.S. city. Way too many souvenir shops, tourist traps, and chain establishments. Although, I have to admit, mummies are pretty cool. It's all really a shame because LA Bay itself is such a gem. Like, I could probably hang out and just watch the ferries come in and out of the bay for hours. Although, they recently rebuilt the ferry terminal in this very utilitarian way, which maybe works better operationally, but I have mixed feelings about. The terminal's reconstruction, as well as the new pedestrian bridge over Alaskan Way, are all part of reimagining the old viaduct footprint and putting it to better use. And look, I've had a lot of requests to talk about the new and improved Alaskan Way, but it's not done yet, and I don't want to pass judgment on something that's half torn apart. But you can see that they've widened the car-free space along the waterfront side quite a bit, with a bike path and lots of landscaping. It's not done yet, but I don't know, I'm probably not quite as pessimistic as some of you all. And until we figure out how to not have ferries at Coleman Dock that accommodate hundreds of cars, I don't know that there's an alternative to having some amount of vehicle or capacity here. This will get its own video at some point though. Okay, in a minute I'm going to get to what I really want to talk about, which is why on earth Pike Place and all the streets entering the market are still open to general vehicular traffic. But first, a brief reminder to do all the engagement types of things. I really enjoyed last week's live stream, and I will be doing more of those in 2024. So activate the bell to get notified when I schedule those things. And all the usual ways to connect on the apps. And the direct support on Patreon really does help smooth out the extremely unpredictable nature of the finances of what I'm doing. Okay, before I get into the complete absurdity that is unfettered vehicular access to Pike Place Market, let's just turn our camera to the east of First Avenue and acknowledge that the city did manage to make that segment of Pike Street car-free, which makes it all the more insane that anybody who wants to drive down Pike Street into the market and just circulate looking for on-street parking or gawk at stuff can do exactly that any time of day, no matter how busy it is. I mean, I'm pro-gawking, but the gawking is much, much better on 
foot. And I don't even know what people are thinking when they try to drive here, but a lot of people do it. It's like they can't comprehend the idea that in a place where seemingly everyone wants to be, they might not be able to drive right up to the place where they want to go and just park their car there, ideally for free. But the Pike Place Development Authority is complicit in promoting this bad behavior. They don't really go to any length to disabuse customers of the idea that they might want to park further away and walk, or God forbid, take transit to the market. Even though 3rd Avenue, two blocks away, is one of the busiest transit streets on the West Coast. And I sort of get it, it's kind of baked into the PDA. Because of the nature of the market, the stakeholders are small businesses that have been there forever. They've been used to doing business the same way for decades. They don't really get penalized for not innovating. So it's hard to break away from the status quo. The traffic conditions in the market are completely outrageous and completely understandable at the same time. And it's not just the vague principle of allowing traffic in a place that should very obviously be a people place. It's really a user experience and probably a safety issue. The sidewalks within the market are much, much too narrow to accommodate the number of pedestrians that want to be there. Because not only are there tons of people walking both directions, there are also queuing areas to get into some of the shops because the shops themselves literally reach capacity. There are people standing and eating because there's no street seating. Like, whoever's making decisions about what the cross section of Pike Play should look like has to be on, like, psychoactives or something. Who on earth looks at this and thinks on-street parking is the best use of curb space? Like, I'd just point out that if you go to Disneyland, which is absolutely laser-focused on creating a great customer experience, they do not let you drive your car through the front gates and then circulate looking for parallel parking along Main Street USA, and they don't put angled parking in front of Space Mountain. Why? Because it would be annoying and aggravating for basically everyone, and annoyance and aggravation are not what they're trying to sell. And in case you're wondering, the arcade itself, which runs along the west side of Pike Place, that's jammed to capacity too. Everything is overflowing with pedestrian traffic, so where else are people supposed to go besides walking the street? The fact that so much of the street's cross-section is reserved for personal vehicle storage, and the fact that traffic is allowed there at all, is just such a massive display of disrespect for the people who come here to spend their time and their money. The fact that people come here anyway is maybe interpreted by the PDA to mean that it doesn't matter if Pike Place is car-free or not, instead of signaling to them just how much they're leaving on the table by using the space so poorly. And look, I get that these are mostly small operators and they need to be able to get their merchandise to market, but that's true for every market street on the planet, and so many cities have learned to do this more thoughtfully. Like, it was pretty common in a lot of the Spanish and Portuguese cities I visited earlier this year to have pedestrianized streets with retractable bollards so that designated vehicles could access the street at appropriate times. It's like so many problems with U.S. cities. The solutions are usually readily available somewhere else on the globe, and we really just have to drop our self-proclaimed exceptionalism for a minute and actually learn something. Because I love Pike Place Market, and I always will, but I also know that it can still be so much more than what it is. And I often think, if we can't make a street like this car-free, with the enormous demand for walking, and standing, and socializing, and eating, then what hope is there for any other street in the U.S.? Seattleites themselves had to do what the city wouldn't back in 1971, and 53 years later, we might be reaching that point again. So you might have noticed I visit Seattle a lot. It's the holidays. What are you going to do? And believe me, I thought about just unplugging for a few days, but that was just never going to happen. Let's face it, being a YouTuber is basically a 24-7 thing. It's my whole personality at this point. So instead, I've been hooked up to dodgy Airbnb networks and a variety of coffee shop Wi-Fis. And, well, that's where today's sponsor, NordVPN, comes in. I mean, it's not like I'm out sipping a single origin pour-over while I'm filling out online mortgage applications. It's usually just writing or editing. But I do spend a lot of time in my Google account, which includes my YouTube studio, and I like spending a lot of time worrying about what kind of information I'm putting out on the local Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi shenanigans can come in a lot of forms, but here's one I find particularly salient. It's the man in the middle attack, or I guess you could say person in the middle, but then you lose the alliteration. The way it works is our malicious coffee enthusiast sets up a fake Wi-Fi hub with the name of the cafe in it. You connect to the fake Wi-Fi hub, and then all of a sudden, they're intercepting everything you send. Chaos ensues. 
not good. Well, if you're logged into NordVPN, which is just one click, that person in the middle is just going to see a bunch of gibberish because NordVPN gives you next-gen encryption, not to mention it's going to block malware and trackers. In other words, when I turn on my NordVPN connection, I feel like I can just focus on the things I'm trying to accomplish. And this is why I'm a huge fan of NordVPN and why I do use it every day, because I'm actually one of those weirdos who's more productive when he's posted up in a coffee shop or a pub. Anyway, if you sign up for any of NordVPN's two-year plans, during this promotional period, you're going to get four months on top if you use my custom code. Also, if you didn't know, using a foreign country's IP address from inside the U.S. can be a cool hack for booking international travel. Like, if you're booking hotels or car rentals, a lot of websites will quote you a higher price if you're originating from a U.S. IP address. Just a tip for you international travelers. Anyway, NordVPN does come with a 30-day money back guarantee, so it's very hard to go wrong here. Again, make sure you use the code down in the description. It'll get you four months for free, and it'll really help support the channel too. Thanks again. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining, and thanks as always to the patrons for directly supporting what I do, and indirectly supporting the inclusion of cat footage at the end of my videos. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.